Hello everyone, and welcome to Scary Interesting. Although the stories in today's video don't involve natural caves, there are some man-made caves where incidents have occurred that are just as horrifying as anything to occur in a natural cave. So, as always, viewer discretion is advised. After the discovery of gold in California in 1848, there was a mass migration of people from the eastern US as well as countries across the world. About 150,000 people from eastern states undertook the long, often dangerous journey on horseback in covered wagons dreaming of the wealth that awaited them. Unfortunately, those dreams would never be realized for the vast majority of them. During the seven-year gold rush, only a few people were actually lucky enough to find gold. Then, by 1855, most of the surface gold was gone, its value had leveled off, and the boom towns turned to ghost towns. This didn't stop the migration, but it certainly slowed it down. During the fall of 1876, brothers True and Dennis Blake were making final arrangements for their own journey west. The exact reason they planned their journey is lost to history, but it's believed they were also in search of striking it rich. In the first few years after leaving, the Blake brothers couldn't seem to get settled. They worked at the docks in Seattle for a while, but then picked up and moved to Spokane Falls in search of land. After wandering for a while and finding nothing suitable, they worked for the Spokane Falls sawmills and lumber camps to save up some money. By early 1880, they resumed their search for land in Idaho, but it wouldn't be for another four years before they finally found the perfect spot. When they heard about a big creek nearby that might be great for farming, they checked it out and established a homestead. They quickly found out that the creek was without gold, but the brothers would stumble on something even better. At dusk one evening, they saw the sun setting reflecting off a rock face above them. When they made their way up to get a closer look, they discovered one of the largest silver deposits in the entire world. In an instant, the Blakes were wealthy beyond their wildest dreams. In those days, there were no laws around mine ownership, so during the gold rush, the mining industry adopted the Mexican system of staking claims. To gain official ownership of a mine, all you had to do was simply be the first to find a deposit, have your sample of precious metals confirmed, and then literally stake off the property to claim it. So after completing this process, the silver belonged to the Blakes. Since they were both originally from the Northeast, they called it the Yankee Load, and it later became known as the Sunshine Mine. The two of them would go on to mine the land for decades, but they never lived long enough to know the true magnitude of what they'd found. In 1904, when the Blakes were too old to mine, they leased it out, and suddenly, the ore was being mined by an army of men instead of just two. With that kind of production power over 97 years, the Sunshine Mine was responsible for more than 364 million ounces of silver, becoming one of the most profitable silver mines in the entire world. By 1972, the Sunshine Mine was still operational, and by then, miners had carved a maze of tunnels and passages as far as 6,000 feet deep into the earth, and there was no sign of them dissipating. On the morning of May 2nd, 1972, the surface foreman counted the 173 men who had lined up to start the day shift. Once everyone was accounted for, they entered the mine and dispersed to various work sites. Most of that morning was like any other, and the mine echoed with the sounds of drilling and chiseling as lunchtime approached. Then around 11.40, the ground foreman began to hear men yelling. This wasn't unusual in such a noisy environment, but there was an unfamiliar urgency in these shouts. It ended up being from two of the electricians deep in the mine trying to get his attention after the work had been interrupted by the unmistakable smell of smoke. With gas-powered machinery throughout the mine, there was always at least a faint hint of smoke, but what the electricians were smelling was different. This smoke was stronger and had a sweeter scent. When the foreman understood what was being shouted to him, he picked up the phone and called down to the mine's mechanics to see if they knew anything about a fire, but they hadn't smelled any smoke yet. So the foreman asked them to search around for a source and report back. After a brief walk around, the mechanics found that the smoke was originating from the 3700 level in an area that sat nearly 4,000 feet below the entrance. What the mechanics didn't find out was fire. They made their way to a different tunnel and found it too full of smoke to enter. Conditions in an adjacent tunnel were the same, so exploring any further was out of the question. By that point though, it didn't matter where the fire was. There was more than enough smoke to start threatening lives in minutes. So the mechanics rushed up to update the foreman, and then at 12.03, he officially ordered an evacuation. He immediately went to the phones in an attempt to spread the word faster, but most of the men only found out about the fire when the smoke found its way to their work sites. The warning system was then activated, and oxygen masks were sent into the mine, but there was a new problem. The fire seemed to be originating from the air intake side of the mine. This meant that as air was drawn into the system, it circulated carbon monoxide throughout the main tunnels between many of the men and the exits. This closed off multiple routes out of the mine, leaving an area known as the Jewel Shaft as their best chance of escape. It was located as far away from the smoke as anything in the mine could be, but it wouldn't stay that way for long. So a few at a time, miners were hoisted up the shaft from the 3100 level where many of the men congregated. 
This continued without pause until 1.02 p.m. when the hoist suddenly stopped with plenty more miners waiting for rescue. The men looked at each other and wondered what the delay was. The smell of smoke was becoming more apparent and men started coughing and choking. What they didn't know though was that the hoist stopped because the hoist man was dead. He refused to leave despite smoke taking over the area, but he couldn't hang on long enough to get everyone out. Outside the mine, 79 miners and foremen stared at the entrance. Smoke was now pouring out and at 1.30 they watched just a single miner emerge from the haze. As the minutes passed with no signs of any others, they began to realize that not everyone would be walking into the mine that day. At 2 o'clock, rescue workers finally arrived at the remote mine, then fitted with masks and oxygen tanks they began to search for survivors. Because the mine was so expansive, rescuers could only search for as long as their oxygen tanks would last, which was about 2 hours. Miraculously, well below the source of the smoke and more than 5,200 feet below the earth, two miners were found alive in a smoke-free space. However, tragically, they were the last two men to leave the mine alive. The remaining 91 men passed away somewhere in the dark tunnels, and many of them were found where they waited for their turn in the hoist. In the months following the disaster, an investigation got underway to determine what happened. The mine was closed for seven months while officials tried to nail down the cause, but the fire near the source burned so hot that it weakened walls and support beams. A partial collapse couldn't be repaired and kept an era that might have produced clues buried under rock and charred wood. Investigators were able to determine that the fire originated somewhere between the 3500 level and 3700 levels, but how it started remains unclear. This incident in 1972 exposed safety weaknesses in the mining industry and was the catalyst for the Mine Safety and Health Act of 1977 being adopted into law. Among its changes, the act required mines to provide more ventilation and create a plan for guiding the response in an emergency. It also required that all miners undergo disaster training so they knew what to do and where to go in any situation they might encounter. Notably, the law also required miners to have personal auction tanks with them at all times. Had that been mandatory at the time of the Sunshine Mine fire, there's little doubt that everyone would have survived. Today, it's still one of the worst mining disasters in American history. The Lassing Talc Mine was a mine in the Eastern Alps, north of Austria, and it sat on top of a massive deposit of talc. After being mined for over 70 years, the mine was at least 607 feet deep, with tunnels that sprawled much further horizontally. In the 90s, the miners continued to follow the deposit, which sort of snaked its way out and then upward back toward the surface. Now, there is a limit to how close a shaft can get to the surface before it starts to compromise the integrity of the ground above. Unfortunately, the decision was made to add a level to the mine which wouldn't have been approved to try to squeeze out all the talc they could. This was done by digging a chamber and then adding support columns to brace the ground above. This also happened to be right under a nearby village. On July 17, 1998, rain began to fall on the Eastern Alps. This wasn't an unusual amount of rain, just the average expected that time of the year. But soon enough, the ground started to soften and as water does, seek out the path of least resistance either above or below ground. 34 miners were working underground that day with 6 at this unapproved level. At some point, they heard cracks from above, then a slow trickle, and then a rush of water. All the rainwater had found the mine and it started leaking inside. Immediately, the miners stopped what they were doing and headed for the exit. Then all of a sudden, the sound changed, but it wasn't the sound of water. It was a landslide. The rainwater had softened the mud around them enough that the earth was now being forced through the passageways. Luckily, this happened slowly enough that they could still get out before the landslide pushed all the way through. Except, not everyone made it out. A 24-year-old named George had been taking a break in a rest area built into one of the levels. He'd also heard the cracking and the rush of water, but the mudslide had blocked him in by the time he got to the room's entrance. There was a small emergency telephone in the room, so George tried to call the service to let them know he was down there, but then the mud began to fill the chamber and he had to drop the call. He rushed to the other side of the room where a safety bunker was built and the mud came right up to him but stopped just before the bunker. So all George had was a little pocket of air and a pack of cigarettes. He could only wait and hope for rescue. Up top, they quickly assembled a team of nine miners and a geologist to search for him after doing a head count and realizing someone was missing. First, they had to stabilize the crater by pumping all the water out, so they brought in machinery to do that. They also knew they still had to be careful because the rain was still falling and the ground was still soft. After a fair amount of water was pumped out, one of the managers inspected the mine and declared it safe for the rescue team to go in. The team's first job was to secure the ceilings. They'd head down to roughly 425 feet and build temporary pillars to shore up the mine. Then, once it was secure, they'd work up to the chamber and hopefully rescue George. So the men suited up and then descended into the mine. They shored up the ceiling on the lower levels, slowly working through each passage. It took them all day and into the night, but then at 10 p.m., everything got much, much worse. The first thing people saw outside was a puff of air forced through the tunnel entrance. Then, a crater the width of a football field started to form in the center of the village above. 
One by one, the street lamps went dark and then tilted inward. Then the power to the floodlights brought in for the rescue went off, and then there was nothing but darkness, the sound of rock giving way, and the groan of the foundation snapping and twisting as houses in the village began to sink. All the villagers were rushed to safety as two of their homes collapsed into the crater. Another 18 cracked and buckled under the strain, and the pillar snapped on every level of the mine beneath them. The ceilings then dropped to the floor, including where the rescue team was working. Tragically, mud and water slowly filled the entire space, leaving nothing left for the 10 men who attempted the rescue. Based on the location of the collapse, the team on top knew all hope was lost for the rescuers, but they still weren't sure about George. He might have made it to the safety bunker, so maybe there was a chance. Unfortunately, the rescue effort was in chaos though. Due to inadequate preparation and poor leadership, getting rescue teams and equipment coordinated took way longer than it should have. So for two days, very little work was done as they tried to coordinate what to do next. All the while, George sat cramped in the safety bunker, unsure if rescue was coming. On the 21st, so four days after the collapse, they finally brought in specialized equipment and began to drill in the direction they thought George might be. It was a slow process, but by the following day, they managed to drill deep enough to get some cameras and microphones into the mine, but they couldn't see or hear anything. After so much time had passed, hope began to fade and people began to assume that they were now dealing with a body recovery instead of a rescue. And then on the 24th, the team noticed a rapid drop in the water level, and although the water had caused the disaster in the first place, some pressure from the water was now holding parts of the mine together. So when the pressure dropped, people felt movement in the ground above, which threatened houses in an even wider area. In response, 50 more people were evacuated from the village, but thankfully this time it quickly stabilized. They tested CO2 levels in the passages the following day and put more cameras into the mine and concluded that George had likely passed away. There was just no way that after all that time he could still be down there. They calculated that there was only enough air to last 24 hours and he'd been down there for 8 days by then. All they could do was finish the dig and retrieve his body. Meanwhile, there George was, sitting in the dark waiting for rescue. He'd found a table to lie on and spent the time daydreaming of his girlfriend bringing him glasses of water. Miraculously, there was a little bit of air getting in and out of the gaps in the wet soil. He also managed to drink some of the water that seeped into the chamber, but by then he was also starting to starve, so either way he didn't have much time left. The following day at 7pm, the rescue team reached the upper level where they thought George's body might be, and George started to hear movement. Then he started calling out to them as best he could to let them know he was alive, and thankfully one of the rescue team members heard him. Finally, they broke through the chamber he was in, and he was strapped to a stretcher and then hoisted up the narrow drill shaft they'd dug. The digging continued to try to find the bodies of the other men all the way until August 17th, but unfortunately they were never recovered. Following the incident, the mine's director and deputy director were accused of submitting misleading plans for the upper levels of the mine and subsequently convicted of criminal negligence. It was 2017 when the first tragedy hit the Rose household. Joseph and Victoria Rose lived in a suburb of Malaga in southern Spain, which is an area known by a lot of tourists as the gateway to the Costa del Sol, one of the most beautiful stretches of coastline in Spain and popular with visitors from all over Europe. To Joseph and Victoria though, it was just the town they grew up in and where they chose to settle down and raise a family. They met in a town just east of Malaga when they were still kids and as they got older, the two best friends fell in love and by 2015 they'd married and had their first son, Oscar. Then they had another son, Julian, in 2017, and like many young families, they didn't have enough money to get their own place, so they were living with Joseph's mother at the time. One sunny day in May, the family decided to head out on a 20-minute walk to the beach. It was beautiful and warm, and the family liked getting out to the seafront whenever they could. Joining the family was Victoria's sister, Anna, and Anna's daughter. But then just as they reached the beach, Oscar stopped walking, turned pale, and collapsed to the ground. At first, they weren't too concerned. He passed out for a few minutes a month before, but then when the doctors checked him, he seemed fine. They thought it was due to exhaustion or maybe heat, but this time Oscar didn't wake back up. Anna ran to call an ambulance while Victoria held on to her son, and then the ambulance arrived and paramedics could tell that Oscar's heart had stopped. They tore open his t-shirt and tried to use a defibrillator to bring Oscar back, but it didn't work. Still in his mother's arms, he was taken to the local children's hospital, but tragically, Oscar was dead on arrival. Even after he was declared dead, Victoria wouldn't let go of her son. In the hospital, she held him tight for hours. When Joseph arrived, he persuaded her to let go of him so the hospital could perform an autopsy and figure out what happened to their son. It was later determined that he died from a rare heart defect, which was just a ticking time bomb that no one could have known about. This loss broke Victoria. She couldn't stand to be in her mother-in-law's home anymore afterward. The memories of her eldest son crushed her every moment she was there. Luckily for them, they had a loving family. Victoria's great aunt had a house just in front of Victoria's mom's and it was big enough that she could live on the first floor while the family lived on the second. Unfortunately, this didn't stop the dark depression that engulfed Victoria anyway. 
She kept all of Oscar's belongings and would get upset if Joseph suggested getting rid of any of the stuff or even handing it down to Julian. She would also visit his grave every week to talk to him for hours at a time, and she also never stopped speaking about him in the present tense, as if he were still alive. In the months afterward, the couple still wanted the big family they always planned and to give Julian the brother that was taken from him. So they tried for another child and soon enough, Victoria was pregnant again. Everything was going well until late into the pregnancy when problems arose and she would end up losing that child as well. This was obviously devastating for the family and was made worse by the fact that due to some complications, it looked like Victoria wouldn't be able to have any more children. Two years later, on January 13th, 2019, the family was invited to a picnic close to the town of Totalan. Totalan is a beautiful town in the foothills of the mountains to the north of Milaga, and the land up there owned by Joseph's cousin Daniel was a great spot for a picnic. After arriving, Julian was playing in the land near his father. He'd been handed a small bag of candy and a plastic cup with some soda in it to keep him quiet while Joseph and Daniel collected wood and cooked the food. At the same time, Victoria was on the phone with the place she worked at, explaining to them why she wouldn't be coming in that day. At one end of the property, Daniel had sunk a deep borehole to find groundwater and hopefully create his own water source. It's not uncommon in that part of the world to have your own well water, and although it was narrow, it was deep, nearly 360 feet. So Daniel would cover the top with a couple of concrete bricks to stop animals or plant debris from falling in. Like many kids that age, Julian had spotted the hole and curiosity got the better of him, and so he ran toward it. Right at the last second, Daniel realized this and jumped forward to try to grab him, but it was too late. Despite the bricks, Julian somehow lost his balance and slipped into the well. Joseph ran over and heard his son crying for about 30 seconds, and then the crying suddenly stopped and there was nothing. Joseph desperately reached in as far as he could, but the gap was less than 10 inches wide, so there was no way he was going to go down after him. He yelled to his son to stay calm and that he was going to come get him, and then both him and Victoria rushed to find help. A few people happened to be walking by as this was going on, and after finding out what happened, called emergency services. Very quickly after that, hundreds of rescuers were mobilized, and the rescue teams also contacted private companies with the skills and equipment needed to get Julian out. After arriving, the first thing they did was see if they could even find Julian. One of the private companies brought a camera that they then used to examine the inside of the hole. They lowered it down, but it got stuck part of the way. Then they tried again, and it did the same. On the third attempt, it started to become obvious what was happening. Finally, on the fourth drop, they found something. Each time the camera was dropped at roughly 246 feet, they'd hit an obstruction of what seemed to be dirt. Then on the last drop, they spotted the plastic cup and a bag of candy Julian had been carrying, but there was no sign of Julian. Somehow he had to have made his way under that obstruction, but they didn't know how he could have done that. Maybe it came down on top of him as he fell because he disturbed it as he passed, but either way, no matter how it got there, they had to somehow dig around it without causing more damage to the sinkhole. On day two, they kept trying to find a way to get to Julian around the blockage, but the obstruction filled the gap completely. On the positive side, they had good reason to think that there was an air pocket down there, giving Julian's family hope that he could still be alive. Eventually, it looked like there were two options. They could either excavate the mountainside to get to him and dig down with heavy machinery, or try to build a second hole parallel to the first one. The man overseeing the emergency response team preferred the second option. He wanted this new hole to be far enough away from the well Julian was trapped in so that it couldn't cause a collapse, and then dig horizontally toward where they thought he was. He also wanted to brace Julian's well so that he could be pulled out without the risk of it caving in on him. Ultimately, they decided to dig two holes, one at an angle toward the space beneath the obstruction and another parallel to the shaft. Unfortunately, this wouldn't be an easy task, and tragically, it wouldn't be all the way until the 24th when the parallel shaft was finally completed nine days after Julian first fell in. Setback after setback had essentially eliminated any chance of finding Julian alive. Helicopters were brought in to ensure the team wouldn't run out of supplies. They also flew in caving specialists who could help if the tunnels collapsed or became too narrow for anyone without training to squeeze through. While they dug, 200 local villagers stood vigil with the family, praying and helping to keep them strong. Joseph and Victoria slept on a mattress in a tent by the hole most nights. They just couldn't bear to leave their son's side. Finally, the well was reached at 1.25am, 236 hours after they began. Beneath the obstruction was a small chamber, and as they hoped, there was an air pocket. But in that air pocket was Julian's lifeless body. Tragically, he had been dead from the start, killed on impact as he fell more than 30 stories. It's likely that he fell a short way onto some obstruction which then broke, sending him plummeting 232 feet to the ground below. Immediately after the incident, the local government urged anyone with a similar bullhole to fill it or adequately cover it. Joseph's cousin Daniel claimed that it wasn't his fault and that he warned them about the well and that they should have done a better job watching their son. Ultimately though, he accepted that the borehole had been dug illegally and pled guilty so that Joseph and Victoria could avoid the pain of a trial. He was eventually ordered to pay 180,000 euros in damages, 660,000 euros the rescue effort had cost, and was given a suspended prison sentence. 
In the aftermath, Joseph and Victoria vowed to stay strong because they said Oscar and Julian wouldn't want them to break down. Victoria still visits their graves every day. If you made it this far, I just want to thank you for watching, and hopefully I will see you in the next one.